Hi, I am Brittany. I'm the Communications and Grower Education Manager for the Idaho Wheat Commission, and I'm here with Casey Chumra, our Executive Director, and we want to talk about Ukraine. We've been getting a lot of questions on how the conflict in Ukraine is affecting Idaho wheat market, the wheat market in general, and so we thought we would answer a lot of those questions here today on a video. All right, let's start with the first question. Is there a shortage of wheat? The short answer is no, but it really is a complicated question. Uh, total global supply, according to estimates from USDA, are still much larger than total demand or what global consumption would be. Um, however, much of that supply really is wrapped up in countries such as China that do not export. So it's not available in the traditional export channels. Um, of course, we've seen a lot of production issues the last few years, starting probably four years ago in Australia with real severe drought that reduced their production. And then what we saw in the Northern Hemisphere this last year, including Idaho, that affected our production and reduced it by 30%. Um, we you know, still are producing a lot of wheat in the world, but the, the location of that wheat uh, makes it a little bit more difficult to make up for large changes, unexpected changes like we've seen in the export transportation and logistics uh, with this conflict in Ukraine. So if there are disruptions in the supply, it will be a few months before we see any of those. Yeah, that's right. Um, most of the wheat that is exported out of the Black Sea, and in this case, Russia and Ukraine, uh, tends to be closer to the, to the harvest date. They kind of uh, have their big exports just after harvest, and then it starts to trail off. And this part of the year, fortunately, is really when there's fewer exports. Of course, it's still significant exports, um, but as they start to harvest, which is the same time as our harvest here, um, that's when we'll really start to see major disruptions, um, especially in the supply. Um, I think that, you know, in Ukraine right now, most of the wheat has been planted because they are a, a winter wheat country for the most part, but we don't know that anybody's going to be there to, to harvest that crop. Okay. And we hear that Russia and Ukraine are referred to as the breadbasket of the world. How much wheat really comes out of Russia and Ukraine? So in terms of production, about 20, excuse me, 15 to 10 to 15 percent of total global production comes out of that region. However, it's 25 to 30 percent of total exports. So any country that is a net importer is relying uh, on all of these other countries that have excess wheat to export. And 30% of that comes from those two countries. So it really is a significant portion of, um, of, of our world supply. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we're concerned about too is, is where that wheat goes and um, if there's gonna be enough to, to supply those, those countries. And where does the wheat go? Russia and Ukraine, the majority of their wheat is going to North Africa, Middle East, and really countries that I would say are um, more price sensitive, closer to food insecurity. And I think that that's one of the major concerns of this entire conflict is if Russia and Ukraine are not available to supply those countries, and maybe we don't have enough wheat to make up for that 30% or the prices are so significantly higher, what's going to happen to those countries? And so I, you know, that that's, I think, why so many people are watching this so closely and keep talking about the fact that it is the breadbasket of the world. And just a side note that those numbers for export, the 25 to 30% of the global wheat exports, don't count all of the wheat that is used domestically already by the people who live in those two countries. That's exactly right. It's the same in the United States where we export about 50% of what we're able to produce because that's over and above what we use here domestically. And that, that's very true in those countries. Obviously, they're supplying their own people first and then exporting everything on top of that. All right. So is there, is there a way for the world to make up the difference? 
It's a really tough question. Um, you know, certainly the higher prices are, are going to push some farmers to maybe plant more wheat, more wheat that they weren't expecting to plant. They were thinking of doing a different commodity, or maybe they were going to leave some fields fallow. But uh, it, it, it certainly is going to be a challenge. Um, I think that you know, here in Idaho, we are seeing and are expecting higher spring wheat planting. Of course, the winter wheat was planted back in the fall long before this uh, conflict ever came up. We were seeing higher prices then as well. So we did see some people shift to winter wheat as well. But I think that we will see higher, higher uh, planted acres to wheat here in Idaho. And can that be logistically exported to countries like Egypt and the Middle East that would typically get their wheat from Russia? It has happened, certainly in the past. You know, the United States um, was a much larger supplier to that part of the region. About 20 years ago, Russia was actually kind of a net importer. And so over those last 20 years, the, the countries that are closer logistically, geographically, um, have shifted more towards that Russian and Ukrainian wheat. So it certainly has happened. Um, and in Idaho, we export 50% of our wheat. So we do have all of the logistics and the transportation to get that to port very easily. Um, and, you know, if we were to produce more here, that also opens up possibly more in other parts of the country that could be exported as well. But this is really a problem for all commodities, correct? Not De just wheat. That's right. Um, I would say that corn, soy, and wheat are probably affected most by the conflict in Ukraine in terms of exports, but the prices have affected all commodities. All commodity prices are high now. That's uh, partially based on uh, all of the input costs that have been rising, all the logistical issues that have stemmed from uh, the pandemic, and we've seen just higher, higher prices in, in all of the commodities. And there, there are about 22 acres, 22 million acres, sorry, um, of cropland that are reserved in government preservation programs, I guess. Is that available to be planted? Can we just go out and plant in those acres or are they held back because of government red tape? Is What are the... Um, hurdles, I guess, to getting that land planted. Yeah, there is definitely the land that is wrapped up in the federal preservation and conservation programs are harder to unwind. Um, there are a lot of fields that, especially here in Idaho, that are left fallow or unplanted on purpose in order to kind of regenerate the nutrients in the soil and then produce a better crop the next year. Um, those kind of fields, it would be much easier to decide to go ahead and plant that outside of their normal rotation. Um, a lot of times they're covered in brush or perennial grasses, things that would need to be cleaned up, but it's a lot easier today with modern technology to be able to do that. Um, and I think the government probably will look at taking maybe some of their additional acres out of their, their conservation programs in order to help combat um, not only the Ukraine crisis, but, um, you know, some of the, the higher prices. Okay. So what, what do you say to people who say that the wheat industry is responsible for prices? Uh, what we always say is that wheat farmers and commodity uh, growers are wheat takers, not wheat, uh, excuse me, price uh, takers, not price makers. So what that means is the farmer never sets the price. They go to their elevator and whatever the, the price is that day, they can decide to sell. So as we see these uh, input costs rising and rising and rising, luckily for right now, the wheat prices are also keeping up with that. But that doesn't mean that at the end of the year, when we pencil out how much it costs per acre to, to grow that wheat, then we get to go and say, okay, this is what we're asking. So there's a lot of risk right now for farmers. Um, you know, if they decide to, to plant wheat at the end of the year, are they gonna get the price that, that covers all of those input costs? And let's say they want to maybe try and take advantage of the prices right now and lock in those prices. 
there's risk in the fact that we are still short water and will they be able to produce the crop to meet all of those contracts? So, you know, it's, it's great to see high prices, but it doesn't really mean that it makes uh, a farmer's job easier. And in fact, right now, it's much more stressful and a lot more risk. All right, because those input costs are so high. That's exactly right. What what are the, some of the things that are driving the input costs? I, obviously, oil prices coming out of Russia. We've heard a lot about fertilizer. Yeah, you know, the input costs were rising really significantly long before this Ukraine uh, conflict. So a lot of, I would say, logistic issues left over from the pandemic, um, unavailability of some inputs, shortages of, of fertilizer, maybe not necessarily in, in whether it exists in the world, but just if it's in the right place and it's able to get there and if there's the rail available to get there. Um, so we've seen a lot of different factors really driving up these input costs. And then as you say, Russia is also a larger uh, producer of fertilizer, for example, 40%, I believe is what, what we've heard. So um, when that supply is cut off and we're already seeing uh, supply chain issues around the world, then that, that's going to probably mean that we'll see them continue to stay high, if not continue to increase. So is there enough seed for wheat to be planted this year yes. to kind of offset some of these issues? There is. Here in Idaho, 60% of our crop is winter wheat, so that's already in the ground. So we know that there was enough wheat for that. And uh, according to NAS, we did see a larger uh, planted area. In terms of spring wheat, we are, are hearing that um, in most places around the state, there is plenty of seed to go around. And if people do choose to plant more wheat, then that will be available. Okay. And what about food aid or, I mean, is there something that the U.S. can do to kind of get ahead of the curve on what is obviously going to be food insecurity? Yeah, so the United States and, and wheat in particular is a really major player in food aid programs around the world. And what that is, there's several different types of programs, but basically food donations, sometimes they do direct cash in these kind of uh, real emergency situations. But wheat is one of the major commodities that is utilized in these programs. And so I do think that we will see um, some increased wheat going out um, as food aid. And I, I certainly think that uh, USDA is, is right on top of that and would expect that we will be uh, called upon to help bridge some of these food insecurity issues. Wheat makes up about 20% of the world's caloric intake, right? That's right. So that's, very significant. That is significant. Very. Um, what what are your predictions or, or what do we see as far as price changes? Whew, if I uh, knew how to predict, I would probably not uh, be here. I'd be out <laughs> making a lot of money, no crystal balls. But, um, you know, there's still just so many questions surrounding this conflict and what the short-term and long-term effects are going to be. I think... Um, the longer it lasts, obviously, the more problems we're going to have. Um, I think in the short term, probably this is going to support wheat prices. And then depending on um, how much wheat is produced, both in Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine probably less than Russia, but Russia has already um, announced that they will not be exporting any wheat through the end of this year. And this is something that Russia has done kind of on and off just to secure their domestic supply as well. Um, they will put on export restrictions. Um, but, you know, in, in this kind of situation where we are just coming into the harvest and they're not going to export anything after that harvest, if they stick to that, um, certainly could make a scenario where the, the prices are, are supported and, and remain high. 
All right. Thank you. Yeah. I don't have any other questions. Do you have anything you want to add? No, but if anybody uh, has additional questions, you know, please contact us. You can put them in the comments or uh, email us directly. Check out our, our new website and you can contact us from there and appreciate everybody tuning in. Yeah. Also through social media, our handle is Idaho Wheat mm -hmm. on Twitter and Instagram and Quality Wheat Simply Grown on Facebook. So if you need to get a hold of us, there's lots of ways. That's right. Thanks. All right. Thank you.